Hey, um, <clears throat> hope you're having a, as good of a day as you can. Um, this guy, George Bogle, uh, pastored the Evangel uh, Church in, in the heart of Detroit, and he was on the radio from 12 to 3 o'clock in the morning, all week long, taking prayer requests. Man, I called him when uh, I needed some help, and he prayed with me, and I got prayers from other people. And then I, I, I call him up, give him a testimony of what God's been doing answering prayer. Uh, he was just a really good, really good guy. You know, he's an operate, he was operating engineer. He used to put in pipe too. There goes the dang picture taker. Well, I got it balanced. Uh, anyway, uh, I had to record it like this so I could put it on, uh, uh, won't go on. MP3s don't go on no more, and I found it in MP3. Anyway, this is a really good message, uh, and just for all of us. Okay. No, I guess I'll push it. Tonight that I trust is a little oh. different than what we oh. normally preach. And yet, I, I believe that it's so important that we do address what we'll be addressing tonight. I want to take two places in particular that we'd be able to look at in the Word of the Lord. One is 1 Corinthians chapter 7, and uh, looking at verse 2 in that verse, so that we can see how that at least sometimes it seems that the Holy Spirit handles the difficulties of life. We as Christians, especially we who are perhaps what some would title charismatics or Pentecostals or faith people or word people or whatever you want, people who believe that God is a miraculous God sometimes believe that everything that is a part of life is to be done in a supernatural explosion of power. And sometimes we forget to realize that life itself is a miracle and that God often uses the easiest method of getting something done. God can deliver you from drugs and alcohol and every kind of weird kinky thing, but his first choice is that you would be held carefully by a mother raised in a loving environment and never even have a desire for drugs or alcohol or kinkiness of any sort. His first desire is that life would be very simple for you. And God will use whatever power it takes to get you away from the devil. But God's plan is simplicity. His plan is just plain simplicity. This is the plan of the Lord. And sometimes God's simplicity seems to us not to be remarkable enough. I remember when we were working with young people, we had this big young man come into the ministry. And uh, he wasn't with a great testimony of drugs and being set free and all of these things. He just simply had come to the Lord. But he said one day as he was speaking to his peers, to other young people, he said, yeah, I'm going to leave the house of prayer. They said, where are you going to go? He said, I'm going to go out. And he was, wasn't real good up here, but God loved him. But uh, yet he said, I am going to go out and I am going to get me a testimony. He said, I am going to go out and start some drugs and alcohol and some ridiculous things, and then I'm going to get set free and come back and have something to tell people about what God has done for me. 
Now, that seems to be kind of outrageous, but yet a lot of people believe that if you can't tell how God's done something fantastic, you don't have any testimony. Listen, you've got a testimony if he's kept you from sin. You've got a testimony if you've never gone into deep and terrible places. You've got a testimony if he's given you peace at night and you've never been beaten up by anybody or, or your parents were wonderful people. That's a testimony. You don't need something that people write up in a magazine saying, this person was rich really terrible, and then God turned them around. We have to be able to realize that one way of God's blessing is simply keeping us and protecting us and giving us safety that this is the blessing of the Lord. So don't believe that you need a miracle to know that God loves you. You can know that there's always a miracle in living, and in the midst of it, thank God, God's kept some of you from some real bad things. Rejoice in that. God's first plan for your life is just mere simplicity. Just little easy things that he's planned. And here we find in 1 Corinthians chapter 7, verse 2, Nevertheless, to avoid fornication, oh, praise the Lord. How are we going to avoid fornication? Let's get down on our knees and pray and really learn how to intercede. Let's get into fasting and really learn to discipline the Spirit. Let's begin to claim the promises of God and put some scriptures on the mirror while we're shaving. Let's just believe God and claim the victory. Let's go on and get prayed for that demon spirits will be cast out. We can think of a whole lot of things, and at some place in somebody's life, everything I mention is appropriate. But here we find that here Paul is speaking about something so simple that some of us would reject it as far as being the power of God. God's plan is the simplest that he has for you if it will work. That's exactly what God has is something very simple. And here Paul is saying to avoid fornication. Receive the gift and privilege and blessing that comes from being married. And if that is not possible, God's got something else if it takes angels. But God's plan for you to be victorious is not angel intervention. His plan is just to have a real good marriage. Now what I'm trying to show you is not a thing where that you are to run out and get married. What I'm trying to say is that there's a principle involved that if God does the things that are meant to be done in your life, you'll find that it's a whole lot easier to be victorious. And so if you're not married, you believe God for grace. If you're not married, you believe God to give you the power to resist the devil. And you go on and believe that God's got his plan for you. But God's real plan is something very simple, and that is supply your need. Supply your need for affection. Supply your need for all that is a part of the marriage bed. Supply your need. Bring you to a place where that you're wonderfully blessed with something that is a provision. This is how God wants to meet your need. And if you're married and it's not working, and 80%, 90% of marriages perhaps aren't, then realize, go back to the drawing board as the body of Christ, and find out what's wrong with our marriages. Wow. Because God's plan and purpose is something very simple to relax you and to give you the power to live in blessing without having a daily fight with everything that God wants for your life. God wants you to be able to rest in Him. Keep that in mind and go with me to Hebrews chapter 12. And we'll look at verse 12 here. Wherefore, lift up the hands which hang down, and the feeble knees, and make straight paths for your feet, lest that which is lame be turned out of the way, but let it rather be healed. Now the problem we have in the body of Christ today is that if you're not a weightlifter, if you are not somebody who is really a champion and strong, you can't make it today. The problem is that it is too hard to be a victorious Christian for most of the people who come to the Lord and ask God for mercy and grace. It is a very difficult hour that we're living in. It's hard for people that are single. It's hard for people that are married. It's hard for people who are babes in Christ. It's hard for preachers. It's hard for pastors. It's hard for everybody. And very few people are asking the question, how can we make it easier? How can God give us understanding so that it's easier to do the right thing, say the right thing, think the right thing, go on in the right way, and be victorious? It's harder to be a Christian tonight than what God wants you to be. 
He's not playing follow the leader and wondering how many people can keep up with him. He's not playing king of the castle, seeing how many he can kick down. He's not trying to make it difficult. Neither is he one who's saying, forget it, you can't make it. Just love me, I'll bring you through. God has a plan of victory, but his plan is to make it easier once you come to Jesus to say, praise God, this isn't hard because God's doing it for me and I'm believing God. The Lord is supplying my need. He He's helping me to be victorious, and I praise and love him for it. Amen. Number one, it's too hard at this particular moment for many people to be victorious Christians. Number two, we should not believe that the only way that you can have a victorious life in the practical sense is to have a miracle to let it happen. It shouldn't be that kind of a relationship. God is not making it something that's impossible for people to do His purpose and will. He has a plan so that you, even though you be crippled, can get on in this journey. You don't have to be perfectly well to make it on this path. God wants the path to be straightened so that cripples can make it, babes can make it, people who are human can make it, so that we can look and see that the Lord is fighting our battles. He's holding back the power of the enemy. God is for us. He's showing us how to think the right thing, do the right thing, rejoice in the right victory. God wants to make it easier for you in this hour than what it is for you to be a believer. God wants to simplify it for you, and you've got to have faith to believe that God can give you understanding how that you can be victorious because God makes it easier. He's doing the work in your life. Verse 12, let's look at it. I hope I can communicate this message because I don't think it's preached very much. And messages that you don't hear very often are not too easy to understand, especially the first time that we hear them. But he's telling us here, number 12, don't be discouraged. Get over your discouragement. God's going to make it easier for you. Don't be wore out. Don't be exhausted. And there's those of you who can say, I've been praying and I don't know. I, I, I want to pray and I don't. I want to read the word of the Lord and I find that I get sidetracked. I want to serve the Lord and I find I'm not doing what I ought. And I don't know. I just don't find the support in my spirit. Somehow, some way, I know to do good and I don't do it. My heart cries out, oh God, help me. But it's not working. It's not working. It's not working. And what is it that Paul is saying here? Number one, do not be discouraged. Lift up the hands who have finally just got tired of doing anything. Tired of doing anything. Lift up the hands which hang down. Be encouraged. Don't be discouraged. I know how many people that are here tonight. And if you were here to give a testimony of what it's been, it's been hard. It's been so hard, the loneliness, but that's not the worst thing. It is that you've wanted to do what God wants you to do, and you fall and you fail again and again. And you ask the question, who shall deliver me from this? And the reason that you come to hear the Word of God preached here, many of you, is because there's power here. And the message, it touches the area of your problem, and you're believing that God's going to help me in this to be stronger. And he will do that, but that's not the entire answer. The answer is that God's going to make a path, an environment, a way of looking at things, a way of seeing things, a way of comprehending and understanding. You're going to find that God supports the life of holiness. He does not just demand it. We're able to understand he demands holiness, yes. But oh, hallelujah, he supports, he cultivates the environment where that holiness is possible. God is not wanting to get glory out of how strong you are <coughs> or how determined you are. God wants to get glory how that when you're not able, he comes along and makes it able for you to be more than a conqueror through the provision that God has. He demands holiness and then he makes it possible. He doesn't leave you with an impossibility. He doesn't discourage you with an impossibility. But he says to the cripples, I'll make a path that even the cripples can travel in. I'll make it smooth enough that even you can walk in it. I'll make it a path that's not beyond you. I will help you. I am the Lord. Where 
therefore lift up the hands which hang down and the knees that hope some way, somehow that God will let me sit. Have you ever been in a praise service when you just felt in your heart, God, let that man of God let me sit down? There's some of you, you don't wait for the man of God to let you sit down. You just sit down in the middle of it. You, you make your own decision. Let them stand as long as they want to. I'm sitting. The feeble knees, the tiredness of standing, the feeling like all I want to do is get the pressure off myself. All I want to do is sit down. I can't stand here any longer. I can't stand here any longer. I can't stand here. And what is Paul saying? You've been tired because of your failure. You've been tired because of your disappointments in a Christian living. You've looked and you've seen that the Christian life is a difficult life because of surrounding difficulty. But be thou encouraged and you hands that hang down because it seems to be more than what you can do to lift your heart and your life to the place that God wants it to be. Lift your hands again spontaneously and begin to praise the Lord because God's not looking for strong saints. He's looking for a people who can hear His voice and live. And God's going to speak the word of deliverance and the word of life and the word of healing. He knows that you're not strong. He's not looking for maturity in a that's been born but he's looking for the power of his name to bring forth victory to those who call upon the Lord there shall be a victory because this is the Lord's doing and it's marvelous in our eyes you who want to sit down so bad be encouraged be encouraged it's not going to be just pressure. Be encouraged because there's some things that you can get involved in that you don't even find a tiredness entering into your mind even when you're weary. Oh, you're able to go on because of the prize, because of the victory, because of the change, because of the challenge. God can quicken your spirit until you don't even know you're standing. You don't even think about it. What you know in that moment is that I'm living and I'm experiencing that this is the Lord's doing and it's marvelous in my eyes. I'm rejoicing because something glorious is happening today. I can remember times gone by and I think the the most weary times in my life have been shopping with Shirley. I just find at times in a shopping center that I feel more fatigued than anywhere else. Somebody else might feel fatigued if they just followed me around in what I do in my challenge as a Christian. But for me, just in a shopping center, it seems like I'd like to sit down. But the people who are sitting down look so conspicuous, I hate to join their crowd. You wonder, why did somebody come all the way here to sit? Why don't you sit at home? And, and so you endure because you don't want to be put on the spot and be a gazing stock, but you sure don't enjoy what you're doing. So many Christians don't enjoy what they're doing. They somehow know that there's something that God has for them, but they're finding so many battles and they're discouraged. And Paul says, don't be discouraged. Don't be discouraged. Get excited again because there's something worth getting excited is going to happen in your life. Verse 13, and make straight paths for your feet. What does that mean? Believe that God can take the difficulties out of your life. We used to sing a song, and it's appropriate in certain cases, but Lord, don't move that mountain. Give me strength to climb it. And a lot of us, we believe that that's exactly all that God's going to do. But God also is a God who says, you can say to this mountain, be thou removed and cast into the sea. He doesn't tell you that you can't get mountains moved. There's times when God says, wouldn't it be just easier just to get the mountain out of the way? We're learning that the easiest way of doing something is the way that's going to reward us the longest. A very smart man can go through a very complicated situation and succeed. But no matter whether there's a smart man that can do that, in any business we know that you better get the complication out of the situation because if you don't goof up with it, somebody else is going to goof up. Don't work so hard, but make it simpler. That's the whole principle in so many different areas of living. Sometimes You've got to be able to make it simpler. You're not going to have any success if it's only that you have the determination. I've made up my mind. 
I'm not going to give in. I'm going to serve the Lord. I command the devil to go. That's fine when it has to be, but that's not a daily program. You don't wake up in the morning doing spiritual weightlifting. You wake up in the morning knowing that God has straightened the path and today's going to be a day of joy because the Lord has blessed me. He makes a way for me. The Lord is my shepherd. I shall not want. He's giving me the blessing and I'm rejoicing in the provision that God has for me and for others. Today it's too hard for young people. It's too hard for married people. You look around about, you find people crumbling everywhere. And why is it that we look and find people that are relatively honest people? If you've ever had anything to do with seeing the heart of Christians today, a pastor especially, finds that wherever he looks, there's somebody that's knocking on his spiritual door and saying, Pastor, I got a problem, and I don't know how to handle it. Pastor, there's something inside of me that's not right, and I don't know how to handle it. I've committed my life to Christ, but I don't like what's going on in my thoughts. I've committed my life to Christ, but I don't like what's going on in my, my living. There's something terribly wrong. We've learned in living that no matter how sincere we are with God, if God doesn't give a way for us, we are deceiving ourselves. And I've seen people today who are Christians who are serving the Lord in so many ways. I tell you, you might be busy all week in serving the Lord, but that doesn't mean that you have victory in your sexual life just because you love the Lord. Now you ought to. You ought to, God ought to be providing. But there's a lot of people that are masking their problems because they have a desire to serve the Lord and they're ignoring their difficulties, but they're all messed up in their living as far as their thoughts and sex, and yet they are active serving the Lord. And we look at them and we think, my brother so-and-so is such a wonderful brother. He's always picking people up and he's always delivering people and he's always doing this and he's always doing something else. And he's got a problem in sex and he doesn't even know it himself. Waiting for it to happen down the street. What do we do in that moment? Do we just pray harder, resist the devil, and go on? No. We stop and say, God, this path isn't easy enough. I want to serve you. My heart is right with you. Now, God, get me in divine order so that I can get the blessings in my life without fighting for them so that I can say that God gave me manna, not because I hold the field and, and raise the crop, but God fed me this morning. He gave me food that was convenient for me, and it's meeting my needs spiritually, emotionally, mentally. The Lord is my source. I am blessed of God and I can rejoice because He is satisfying my spirit and my soul. Sometimes I look and I see some of the people that are the most respected in this church. And I haven't said a word to them, but I can tell in the spirit. As much as you gladden our heart in your Christian service, man, you got a problem sexually. It shows up in the spirit a mile away. And you look and you see that that person, is he sincere? Yes. Does he love people? Yes. Is he with a heart to serve the Lord? Yes. But is there areas in his life where he's starving to death? Yeah. Starving to death. Is he walking the most difficult path that could ever be? Yes. And brother, you need to get back to God and say, God, what simple thing do you have to solve my problem? What simple thing do you have to make it so I can walk in victory? What simple thing do you have that causes this stirring in my spirit that the devil wants to make a fool out of me? How, God, can I move into peace and joy? My path is not an easy one. It's not a straight path. It is the most difficult path. And I'm huffing and puffing and claiming in Jesus' name that I'm not going to be destroyed. But, God, this is not the way of the kingdom. The way of the kingdom is the way of a plan. 
And God, bring your plan into my life so that I can rest in thee and say, praise God, this is a piece of cake. I am living in the land of victory. There's blessing and prosperity, and I'm tasting and seeing the Lord is good, and I'm satisfied. I'm not struggling, but by God's grace, I'm satisfied that the Lord is leading, guiding me day by day. Are you having a hard time sexually? Then there's something wrong in the simplicity of your life. And you're trying to compensate by Christian service. You can't compensate by Christian service. You can't compensate by determination. That's not the way that you make it. It's by finding that God is a father and he's a provider. And he finds many ways of supplying the need that you have. And the needs that are in your life, they cannot be ignored. They have to be met. Seek ye first the kingdom of God and his righteousness. And all these things will be added unto you. God will supply what you're lacking. And God will give you victory. Trust in him. Lean not upon your own understanding. In all your ways acknowledge the Lord to show you how to walk this path without having to be a super strength hero know that God has made it for cripples that they can live like saints because God has given them the victory through Jesus Christ the Lord More than who's going to walk in victory in the church we haven't understood God's plan or purpose until cripples can make time on this highway until cripples can make time on this highway Cripples are meant to be able to make the speed limit. Cripples are meant to be able to move down this highway 55 miles an hour. Cripples who have impediments in their life, impediments in their natural abilities, are meant to be able to find that on this highway the cripple makes good time. On this highway the cripple has victory. On this highway the cripple has a record that he can look at and say, this is the Lord's doing. On this highway alcoholics don't get thirsty. On this highway drug addicts don't have a desire to get high. On this highway a man with sexual problems finds that God has given things to satisfy him. Men who are cripples are able to walk this path in victory and not be under great stress. They know that this is the Lord's doing and it's marvelous in our eyes that cripples can make it on this highway. What I'm talking about is faith for something that hasn't been seen in the church yet. But God gives grace. Reading a book written by a Christian psychiatrist or a psychologist one and yet it's a secular book it's given to the market for the average consumption of those that hurt in the world as well as in the church and he mentions the fact that as a Christian he was so confused as he looked around about in his counseling practice and he found out that Christians have as much problems as non-Christians in the realm of sexuality he said, I found out that there was no difference and, I, and my heart was disturbed and I wondered, is there something wrong with people's commitment to God? Is there something wrong with the power of God? Why is it that we have as bad a track record in the church concerning sexuality as we do in the world? And make no mistake about it, you're beginning to find out that the track record of the church isn't much better than the world. Teenagers raised in the church they find that they're pulled just as much as those who are in the streets. We look around and we find married couples who have been praying together. And we look and find that they're in the divorce courts. We look and we find adultery in leadership. We find it in the pew. We look everywhere and there's a breakdown. And we deplore it and we discourage it in our hearts. And we wonder what is wrong with the church. We must not really mean what we're saying. That's not it. God is saying, when are you going to ask me to make it easier to get through the week in the body of Christ and to sing, oh, thanks be unto God who gives us, who gives us, who gives us, who doesn't get it from us, but who gives us the victory through Jesus Christ the Lord. We have the victory because it is a gift. And the more that he wrestled with the 
apparent truth that he was facing that religious people, born again people, people who were sincere were falling apart as much as people who were not even close to God. And he began to ask God for the ability to help those that he was counseling. And he found out that in his work, that the direction that brought the victory was to get out of marriage what marriage was intended to give. And so he began to straighten out marriages. He began to sense what God wanted to do through marriage. And he understood that God will not do through the church as far as other activity, what God intends to do for the Christian or whoever he has chosen, what he has ordained to do through his own ordaining, such as marriage. If God has ordained something for marriage, then you better realize that this is God's plan and you better mind it for all that it's worth. Because if you don't get out of marriage what God wants to have come out of marriage, you're not going to get out of ministry what marriage is meant to give. You've got to find out what God is saying about social relations, about the relationship of a husband and wife. You've got to ask God, help us to perfect what you've given us. We are stewards of marriage. We're stewards of it. We're not only stewards of our own, but we're stewards of the understanding of the vehicle that marriage is. Marriage is a vehicle that people can walk in and find deliverance and victory. And we need to say, God, restore the joy of our marriage. Restore the joy that's meant to be in this marriage. Let us know that eye has not seen nor ear heard what God has prepared in marriage for those who are participants in it. Because it's a gift from God. And Lord, in this moment, don't just give me an angel to help me through today but give me wisdom that I can get out of marriage what you've ordained that I can resist the devil and say Satan you've got no place here I'm on an easy path I've moved off of this difficult path I've moved over to easy street it's glory hallelujah and I can serve God because praise God it's easier than what it was Paul said to avoid fornication Find it easier through marriage. Let marriage solve a problem. That's not very spiritual if I were to listen to what is usually taught in the church. No, what I ought to do is simply believe God, claim His promises. Paul said no. He said, let God's plan work in your life. God is not asking for you to believe in a miracle when He's got an ordinary plan. He never told anybody to go through the year without plowing and, and planting seed. And come in harvest time and begin to have a prayer meeting. And believe that God's able to bring food down from heaven. No, He wants you to go out and He wants you to do what He has already said is common sense. Is a plan that He's given for creation. He's already given away. And there are certain areas that you're asking for a miracle in that you don't need a miracle. You need just God to provide in the common sense way that He's told you. And when you get that provision, you won't be coming back for miracles every time. You'll be coming back with rejoicing saying, God's got a plan for my life and what do you know? It works. Everything that God has ordained, get all out of it you can. What happens in marriage? We don't know what marriage is anymore. We haven't even asked the question too often. We've missed the whole thing. What do we have? We have separation. And it's not the fault of an individual, but yet it's a fact. What happens to two people who get married? They separate. They get a divorce as soon as they get married. You follow what I'm saying, and I'm just bordering on the ridiculous a bit but what happens they get married and the man goes to work that's separated from his wife and we don't even realize that the joy of marriage is unity and life demands because of where we live and how we live in situations that the first thing we have to do after we get married is to get a divorce for some people it's to go into the military that's harder than marriage and he goes across seas for other people, it's to drive a truck, to be out of state. For someone else, it's to work six days a week or seven, ten hours a day. What happens? We get married and then we hurriedly get a divorce. And then in other situations, what happens? We find that the husband and wife both go to work and so they compound the divorce and they find that there is so little time together and we're asking, God help me in my marriage. God help me in my marriage. And God says, you don't have a marriage. 
You don't have a marriage, you have a desire for a marriage. What you have is a divorce and you aren't even making bridges to the thing. And so what happens? You're two people that are very separate and you get together from time to time. But what you've had, you've had quite a bit of a divorce. And then children come. And so the wife, she has to stay with the children. The man gets involved. He's got to have two jobs because the bills are more and they need shoes and they need this. And we might want to put him in a Christian school. And so we'll hurry up and we'll go ahead and go to work some more. And you go to church because I'm tired. I'll take care of the kids. they got to get up in the morning. And so the man goes to work. And if he's desiring to serve the Lord, he may go to church. And uh, if he stays home and snores and she goes to church and she talks a while to the people. And he wakes up and he finds out she comes home two hours after the church is over. And he doesn't think she's running around, but he resents it. At least she could be here. We, we're, 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 we're in trouble because we don't have a marriage. You see, we have more divorces than we think. We have more divorces than we think, and it takes the miracle of God to make a marriage. Except the Lord build the house, they that labor, labor in vain. And so people are closer to the secretary, they're closer to the friend, they're closer to the person on the line that they're working with than they are their own wives. And we call it a marriage, and it is a marriage, but it's a marriage nearing, needing a miracle. And God says you've got to bring it closer together than this. Uh, and there's no book that you can read that can tell you all about it. But you can call upon me, and I'll help you if you just call upon me. I'll make it a bit easier. It's too hard. And then we look and we find that God gives us children to raise. And that's God's plan that the home is a sheltered place where the children are kept from the winds that blow so they can be easy for children to grow up without being perverted, without being lazy, angry, mean, and all the things that are devious. And yet we look and we find that when God gives us a home, what happens? Mother's tired because she's working. Dad's tired because they're working. Turn the TV down. We've got to get some sleep. Turn the TV down. Will you turn that thing all down? And will you now turn it off? And will you clean your room? And listen, we got our own problems. Will you quit that fighting? I'll beat you both up. You keep it up. I can't stand it anymore. And what happens? We've got a problem. Why? Because God hasn't given us the wisdom because we haven't asked him. But he's a revealing God and it's a time of a miracle. God is saying, I want to make it easier to live in this hour. I want to make it easier for you to survive in this hour. You're asking me for a miracle, but I'm asking you for your heart to turn to me for direction. I'll show you that I've already provided, but you've got it all messed up. But I'll heal it, saith the Lord. I'll make it straighter than it is today. And so adults get hung up on fantasies of the perfect person that maybe could enter their life that would be better than this. And the children have fantasies of success and great popularity that's better than this. And we go through life and we come to church and we trust that God's power will come down and touch us in a way that will help us to live better than this. But what we need to know in this hour that until the Holy Spirit begins to convince us that it's not that we're going to have greater power, but praise God, it's going to be less resistance because the battle has already been fought. And God says, I'll make the path straight for you so that crippled people can stay in this path and they can rejoice until that happens. There's not much hope for us. Make straight paths for your feet. Make straight paths for your feet. Why? lest that which is lame because if you don't then imperfect people aren't going to make it if you don't make easy paths and that's what straight paths are and they knew what it was that we make the path to get through the hard place as best as we can we wiggle and we squirm through briars and brush around mud holes and craggy rocks we go crooked, we go this way, and we go that way. Because it's the path that's the only way we know to struggle and make it. But as long as we struggle and make it, and as long as we look at the things that God has given us, and say, the devil's in this, and I don't understand that, and we leave it stay the way that it is, we're going to find that until God gives us faith to believe, that life can be joy, that marriage can be blessed, that the home can have the blessing of the Lord upon it, 
that saints can rejoice in the Lord and in the power of His might until we believe that there's an easier way. There can be no victory. It's got to be easier than it is tonight or we'll never fill this place with saints. We'll get some people who are still hanging on. We'll have a few people who are still left who haven't given up yet. And when they fall down, somebody else will take their place. But God's plan is to lengthen your cords and drive down the stakes and get your tents ready for more people to come in who are going to make it because God is teaching us how to do it easier than ever before. The Lord is the captain of our salvation and he's encouraging us to trust him. He's the Lord and by his grace we can make it. I see preacher's sons not making it. Preacher's daughters not making it. Christians raised in the church whose young people aren't making it any longer. And I walk into churches and I hear the parents singing and I look on the back rows and I see the teenagers poking one another because they're tired and bored. I see them pulling each other's hair and winking and going on and acting like they did nothing. Why? Because they can't stand it. They're worn out. Mentally, emotionally. Why? Because nothing's working. The marriage isn't working. The home isn't working. The church isn't working. Why? Because it's too difficult. Have you ever got something home and the directions are so unbelievable? Have you ever bought some things and you look at the thing put together? You get it home. We got one of those things home and I looked at that thing. It looked all right in the store. It was put together. And I got this thing as big as a Bible telling you how to put this thing together. A hundred and fifty little pieces. I was so mad I felt like throwing it. What is this thing? An obstacle course? I bought this so that I could enjoy it. And I got to go through this. And I don't even understand it. And I'm sure that all the directions make sense. But listen, I find this hard. What's somebody else going to do? Somebody can't even read, hardly, and they took this thing home. How are they going to put it together? You'll go bankrupt except you find a way to tell people how to do it easier than that. You'll never be able to have success until you can say, here's some easy directions. Trust God this way. Believe God that way. Walk this way. You can make it. You will sing before tonight is over because this thing works. Until we can see people who are crippled, until we see them marching in victory, knowing it's not because they're strong, not because they're determined, but because Christ is determined. But he said to the poor, the gospel's going to be preached. The good news is going to be preached to those who don't have anything. Listen, Christianity doesn't depend upon people having something. And over the years, I've come to the place that I've understood that if somebody doesn't get saved who's got good character, determination, some kind of a de determination and a maturity, I look and I know he's not going to make it, she's not going to make it, they're not going to make it. Why? Because it's not easy to walk this path. It's not easy to go in victory in this path. Then you better quit looking for stronger people. You better find out what's wrong with your program because God's plan for the gospel is that it can be given to a poor man and he'll be richer than he ever was. Given to a drug addict and he'll be freer than he's ever been. Given to an alcoholic he'll sing with joy. Given to a man who's hung up sexually and he can come forth in victory. This thing is meant to work. Oh, it's got to work. But it works when it's easy. The gospel has got to be easy. Now I could preach the other side of this coin and I've preached it enough times that you, you understand that. But I'm preaching after we've done all that we can to stand to realize that we don't stand because we're strong we stand because God's given us ground to stand on to stand on hallelujah 
If you're a Christian, if you're saved, you want to serve the Lord. If you got that much of honesty in your heart, and if you're having a sexual problem, then don't take all the blame yourself, but get back and say, saints of God, pillars of God, men of God, find out how to get this thing to work because it's not working for me and I'm not going to take all the blame. I believe God wants me to be victorious. I'm willing. Now show me how it can work. In any authority realm, the failure of the system is covered and masked by putting the blame on the person who fails. You never hear a, a kindergarten child coming home or a first grader saying the school failed me. The teacher doesn't know how to teach. No, I guess I'm dumb. Because the smart ones make it. There's some in the class that get an A. Why didn't you? There's somebody in the class who got passing grades. Why didn't you? And we know that there's both sides of the coin and the student has to be a participator too. But listen, the student isn't the only one who fails. The Christian who's missing the mark isn't the only person who's failing. There's something wrong with the church when people can't make it who are weak. God's plan is to explain it in such a way that the child with the least amount of ability can learn his ABCs, can learn to read, can learn to add, can learn to subtract. This is not made for Einsteins. This is made for people that God has birthed. And so is it in the church. It's God's will that you can be victorious if you want to. And if you're willing, he'll even put the want to in you. Let's quit just failing those who don't get the grade. And let's recognize we all have to take responsibility for our own actions. But at the same time, maybe the teacher doesn't know what she is supposed to be teaching the way that she ought. And maybe it's not the 30 kids in her class. Uh, maybe it's just possible that she isn't gifted like she ought to be or she's missing answer. something. Let's ask something from the teacher as well. And in this hour, let's ask something from the church. Let's do our homework and say, God, why do we have these people on an obstacle track uh, when we ought to have them on pavement shouting and singing and praising the Lord that the tomb is empty, that our God reigns, uh, that he's filled us with peace and joy that greater is he that's in us than he that's in the world I always feel nervous when a first grade teacher grades the kids test with an answer key I think man if she needs an answer key then what do the kids need if she's got to know they got the right answer with an answer key, we are in trouble. This is first grade. What in the world is that teacher using an answer key to find out that they don't know what they ought to know? If she can't do it with her eyes and her ears, then we're in real trouble, aren't we? Why does the third grade teacher need an answer key to know that Sammy, you missed here. You see this? My answer key says you're wrong. Huh? Let's give them all answer keys. Damn and make them all teachers. If the only difference between the teacher and the student is an answer key, then we're missing something. But God is a teacher. And he's able to teach us. And the answer key is the Holy Ghost. And he can bring you to the place that you can say, Praise God. Teacher, I know what you know. Because the gospel is the power of God to teach me. Pretty bad. 
We have to have answer keys for seventh grade teachers. Uh. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And you're wrong again. Brother, if it takes an answer key to know that the child is wrong, then something's wrong somewhere along the line. Because you've got to learn it in your heart and your spirit. And you've got to know, I know the material. Praise God. I know that God's not made it so hard that you've got to have an answer key. That you've got to have cliches. And you've got to have religious phrases. And, and you've got to have religious attitudes. And you've got to act the way that Christians do in order to get a passing grade. I know that God's done something basic. Basic to my spirit. Basic to my heart. It works because God's made it easier than it's ever been. Why did Jesus come? Because the law was too hard. Was too rough a taskmaster. Was too difficult. It was right. But it was too hard. And people who were cripples couldn't handle it. When Christ comes, he makes it so that we do what's right. But we do it with ease because he's written his law in our hearts. Hallelujah. Thank you, Jesus. The law is not written in the hearts of people. They're hanging on saying, God, deliver me from this demon. I think I got. I think I better go have so-and-so pray for me. I remember I was young. The work of the flesh was working in my life. I wanted victory. I think sexuality is a real problem for young people. And middle-aged people and old people. And I heard about this woman. She was good at casting out demons. And she was from Ohio. Somebody told me about one of the big churches. She'd been there. Man, she, she was able to get people set free. And I said, Lord, I want to go see that woman of God. I got in my car. I was just a young man, just a youngster. I was going to deliverance. I was going to get prayed for. I was going to get the demon cast out. I was going to be set free. I was going to get the victory. Glory to God. I was going to get the victory. Oh, glory to God. Down 75. I was going to get the victory. Oh, another street. Down that way. Another highway. I'm on my way to victory. Lord, help me find this woman of God. God directed me. I started asking around preachers, where is the woman of God at? Where's the woman of God live at? Finally, I found out where the woman of God lived. I knocked on her door. I said, you're the woman of God. She says, come on in. I sat down and I told her my problems. Her eyes started spinning. I said, I don't want no more mess, woman. I came to get set free, not to get tangled up some more. I want to get out of here. She said, the best way for you to get out of your problem is stay here all night. I said, ha, ha, I got better news than that. Even the devil wouldn't tell me a lie like that. Let me out of this mess. I didn't come here to get worse. I came here to get better. I didn't come here to get bound. I came to get set free. I didn't come here to be a slave. I came to be a free man. Get out of that mess. Hallelujah. But so often, as long as we got the key, the score key, we said, let me grade your paper. I want to tell you that God will do it in your spirit. He'll work it in your heart. He'll manifest his power and his glory. He's a God of deliverance. He's a God who will set you free. He's a God that will liberate you. When the power of God moves in your life, He'll change you and you'll find it's not that hard. I wasn't preaching too many years. Serving the Lord and dedicated to God. And I never really got a call like this before in my life. A woman called me on the phone. 
with a real sensuous voice. She said, Pastor Boba, I said, yes. She said, I want you. I said, no, you just think you do. You really want the Lord. She said, I, I appreciate that answer because I'm your wife. <laughs> Some of you are just getting it now. <laughs> but so often, we live in this hour with the scorecard. And we're given the right answers to other people, but it's not coming out of our belly because we haven't experienced it yet. But there is an experience. Follow on to know the Lord that makes it easy, that gives you the victory, that makes you an overcomer, that you can say, praise God, I'm moving where I couldn't move before. The Lord's helping me right now. I don't care what your experience is, but marriage is meant to work. The home is meant to work. Christianity is meant to work. Have faith in God. It's not a hard path. He is a God that's saying to you, come back to me and learn how to come into the realm of the spirit where that a cripple could make it. A man with a problem could make it. A woman with a problem could make it where it's the joy of the Lord and the blessing of God and you say, it's not hard. Praise God, it's easy. I see that His yoke is easy. His burden is light. This is the Lord's doing. Give Him a praise offering. Keys can cover the fact that we're covering difficult material. They're furnished to each teacher so that she can perfectly grade the class. But we're not here to grade the class, we're here to teach the class. We're not here to grade the class, we're here to equip the class. And when we found that the gospel works in our life, you don't have to have a score key to grade a first grade's paper. You know that God's given you that, the same as he's given it to the child, and both of you rejoice together because you can confirm that God has given that first grader the right answer, and you can do it out of your spirit and say, I know, because he taught me too, and first graders can learn. Second graders can learn. Third graders can learn because God doesn't make it beyond us, but he makes it more than possible through Jesus Christ who loves us. Stand with me in this house. How hard is it for you to be a Christian? Do you think you need another miracle? No, you need something set in your or in order in your life that's very basic. Very simple. Something hasn't been straightened out yet. That's not that difficult. But it's making it hard for you. You're going to have to learn to love and respect your parents. You're going to have to learn to let other people be wrong and pray for them without being short tempered and frustrated. You're going to have to learn how to let God work in your spirit in little things. You're going to have to learn that God doesn't give us power to fight personal battles. He gives us power to fight ministry battles. But in our personal life, his yoke is easy and his burden is light. And he satisfies the longing of the soul. He gives peace. He gives peace. 
I've seen young people who've been antsy. I see young people at times that can't settle down. That happens to us. I remember it happened to me when I went to the Navy, came back. I just walked up and down the living room with a caged animal. I couldn't sit down. I just couldn't relax. I've been running too long to sit down. But then I've seen times when God lets young people sit down. Let them relax. Allows people that are older to sit down to relax. All of a sudden, all that hyper is just melted away, and the peace of God that passes understanding begins to settle down in the spirit. And you look and you realize that it's different. It's easier. It's easier. It's easier because the path has been made just a little easier by the grace of God. You came here tonight, some of you, to get set free because there's some things in your life that you can't understand how a Christian could have in your life. You came here tonight because you need a miracle. I want to tell you that your life is too hard the way it is. For some reason, it ought not to be that hard. You shouldn't need that kind of a miracle just to make it when God's done so much for you. You need God to start straightening out some things He's already given you so that you can find it a whole lot easier. Just to rest in the Lord. Just to rest in His grace. And the Holy Ghost has been in this place and He's here right now. And while you're standing, there's some of you that you need to hear His voice that says, My yoke is easy and my burden is light. In my path, a cripple can walk in and make good time. And you haven't been making good time, but God brought you here for a reason. God wants to straighten out and simplify your situation, your life. And I want you to come and stand in the front of this church with expectancy see today. But God's going to do it for you even tonight. Now, you won't see it totally done tonight, but you'll see it begun. You may forget the message. God may have to return it to you six months down the road. But the Word of God never returns void. God accomplishes what He sends it forth to do. God has a way of giving peace. God has a way of satisfying you. And that's what God wants to do right now. He wants to bring satisfaction. I want you to trust the Lord. I want you to believe God that your Christian life, it's too hard. It shouldn't be that hard. It doesn't have to be that hard. You're going to need wisdom and knowledge from the Lord. But it doesn't have to be this hard. The only thing that living